everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a very, very special guest with me today, Chris Giancarlo, who is the former CFTC chairman, as well as the director of the Digital Dollar Project, in addition, senior counsel at Wilkie, Farr and Gallagher. Um, Chris, it's, it's an honor to be speaking with you. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Well, you're very kind, Tony. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Looking forward to it. So let's start with your background. Uh, where did you grow up and what did you want to be when you uh, were growing up? <laughs> so I grew up in, in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, which is the northeasternmost state uh, a county in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. Um, my father's uh, our, our sort of family arc has been built around the New York City area. My father was a, uh, a, a surgeon in New York City at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary and chief of surgery there. And I spent uh, most of my childhood weekends uh, riding into Manhattan with my dad as he did uh, rounds at the hospital. And uh, we grew up in a lovely leafy suburb of New Jersey. And that's where, I, that's where I've made my home um, uh, through much of my career. I've lived in London, lived in Washington, but uh, I raised my family here in Bergen County, New Jersey. Oh, wow. So oddly enough, you are not very far from me. I, I lived in Hoboken and now I'm in Cranford, New Jersey. So <laughs> stones throw away. Uh, two great towns, very different. Hoboken is, a, is a, w one of my favorite towns in America. It's, and it's very American, the home of Frank Sinatra and the uh, and Helmer's restaurant and so many great places. And Cranford's a lovely area. I know you're, you're raising a young one. That's a wonderful place to raise a family. Yeah, absolutely. I think just the uh, pandemic forced my wife and I to move out here, get a house versus a condo. So we, we love it so far. Um, awesome. So can you tell us about you know, what you did before you were at the CFTC? Yeah, so the CFTC and being a regulator was my third career. I actually began my career as a practicing lawyer and I practiced law for 16 years in New York and in London uh, and was largely representing European technology companies to come into the United States uh, to sell their goods and services and to access US capital markets. I took a number of companies public and, and raised private equity for them, but all technology. In fact, the, 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 all of my career has been spent sort of in an intersection of law, technology, uh, and markets. Um, after 16 years as a practicing lawyer, I went to Wall Street uh, with a group of entrepreneurs that were building some of the first electronic trading platforms for complex over-the-counter derivatives known as swaps. And I spent 14 years helping build a GFI group from a small Wall Street partnership uh, through rounds, several rounds of private equity and eventually took the company public in 2005 and conducted a very successful uh, uh, secondary offering in 2006. And uh, by 2008, we had grown the firm into the world's largest uh, global network for trading over-the-counter credit default swaps. And it was during the the nadir of the crisis, right in the center of the storm, where I really uh, became convinced that the over-the-counter swaps market needed some, some just core reforms. Uh, it, certainly, it should have been uh, a regulated activity to uh, intermediate swaps transactions. Swaps data should re be reported for regulatory uh, observation and some degree of uh, appropriate market uh, transparency. And, um, and then I also believe that uh, those swaps that could be cleared would benefit from central clearing. In fact, uh, uh, long before the government decided to mandate central clearing, I was involved in an effort to bring central clearing to mm -hmm. the swaps market to create, uh, took the Chicago clearinghouse and turned it into the premier uh, credit default swap clearing house. Anyway, it was um, uh, during the end of the crisis when I publicly commended President Obama and the Congress for passing the Dodd-Frank Act, mm -hmm. that a few years later, President Obama reached out, his administration reached out and asked me to serve at the CFTC as a commissioner, which I was sworn in in June of 2014. And then um, uh, in 2017, President uh, Trump asked me to stay on and chair the agency. And one of the things I'm most proud of, Tony, is that somehow, I was unanimously confirmed the first time, uh, but I was unanimously confirmed the second time under a different president, uh, which shows that either, which is both of these are probably true. The first time 
Uh, most people, most senators don't know what the CFTC does. Mm -hmm. And somehow I hadn't annoyed enough of them to, to have them stop me the second time around. So I'm very proud of, of having established goodwill on both sides of the political aisle, which is very difficult to do these days in Washington. Absolutely. And, and that's certainly a big win, uh, you know, your, to your point, being unanimously uh, voted in. Uh, very cool. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, at, at your time at the CFTC, um, obviously you had a lot on your plate and I'm sure things like cryptocurrency started coming on the map. And um, can you take us behind the curtain and what you were dealing with to help maybe bring clarity around Bitcoin crypto and the entire crypto market? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that a uh, lesson I've learned in life is you, you go, you take on something with a clear sense of what you want to achieve and then life intervenes and you find that you're suddenly working on things you hadn't anticipated. And any of your listeners ever have the chance to take a leadership role or go into government, I think we'll find that's very much true. I went to the CFTC to focus on swaps reform and the, and the lessons I had learned in the financial crisis and to um, implement the swaps reform in a way that I thought was uh, 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 well suited to the marketplace that I knew quite well. Um, I didn't go to the CFTC to focus on uh, digital assets and cryptocurrency, but that's life. Um, well, while I was at the CFTC, um, uh, Bitcoin continued to grow and develop. And during the course of 2014 turned into 2015, uh, I watched this development even more closely in 20, uh, spring of 2016. I spoke uh, about publicly about the importance of a do no harm approach to the blockchain and was increasingly focused. We, I was involved in some of the early decisions by the CFTC, including the early decision to recognize a Bitcoin uh, as a commodity and not as a, as a, a security. And um, uh, by the time I became chairman in 2017, uh, uh, Bitcoin was growing um, uh, in value uh, at, at a very rapid rate. And it was the time when we were approached by two of our major um, exchanges about listing uh, Bitcoin futures mm. on, on the marketplace. And so my journey into the Bitcoin rabbit hole came about as the chairman of an agency uh, faced with the um, submission of two of our major clearinghouses to list Bitcoin futures as licensed products on our exchange. And it was a challenging um, uh, a choice. I faced an enormous amount of pressure uh, from overseas regulators and some here in the United States uh, to, to block the launch of Bitcoin futures. Wow. Um, many thought that it would, quote unquote, legitimize uh, Bitcoin. And for a number of central bankers and finance ministries, uh, they're very concerned about uh, Bitcoin as competition to their own um, uh, native currencies, their own sovereign currencies, uh, as well as consumer issues and, 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 and consumer protection. Um, but we looked at it carefully and felt that um, uh, the CFTC has a unique approach to new products, unlike uh, other market regulators and bank regulators that actually approve new products. The CFTC, I think quite wisely, asks our exchanges, which are self-regulated and, and are which are their self-regulators of their members, but they are regulated by the CFTC to certify that the product meets core principles. And if it does, then that certification of that product goes forward. It's not deemed to be appropriate for politically appointed regulators to judge the value of an instrument. It's for the market to judge the value of an instrument. Sure. And so with those principles in mind, uh, we did not take steps to block the launch of Bitcoin futures. I believed at the time and still believe today, in fact, I, I had an op-ed in the, in the uh, Financial Times just last week saying that while there may be many opinions on both sides of, of, of the debate of the value proposition of Bitcoin, ultimately those difference of opinion should be balanced out in a marketplace to determine value, not for uh, politicians or politically appointed bureaucrats to make that determination. 
And that's the approach we took. And I think that the market has shown that it's capable of setting the right value and competing between the, those who, who think the value is high and those who think it's slow to come out with an appropriate equilibrium. That's what markets do. Markets do that better than, than anything. And we created a regulated, transparent marketplace in which those value equations could be debated and, and resolved. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for taking that stance, a principled approach to uh, regulating the market. And uh, it sounded like there was a lot of the traditional financial world against Bitcoin and crypto at that point. But then now the dichotomy of where were we've come, you know, years later, now you have the banks on board, every, everybody on board, you know, from your position, what's it like to see that and see, see the capitulation, so to speak? So, so you, you really, it's right. I mean, I mentioned opposition we had from central bankers. We also had opposition from, from Wall Street itself. Um, uh, the, the, the founder of Interactive Brokers took out a full page Wall Street Journal advertisement with a letter addressed to me as chairman of the agency wow. saying, if you allow this to go forward, that it'll be the end of modern civilization as we know it, <laughs> or something equivalent to that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm a believer in markets. I, I ultimately believe markets resolve these issues. Now, mm -hmm. that's not to say that it's uh, anything goes. I, I'm a, also a believer in, in good quality regulation. If I were not a believer in that, I wouldn't have gone to Washington and devoted five years of my life to, to trying to bring about good quality regulation. But I think well-regulated, orderly, transparent markets ultimately are the best way to, 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 to establish the true value of a commodity than is any um, a, 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 you know, non-elected bureaucrat or politician. I think that's the way markets should resolve different viewpoints as to the, 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 the worthiness of whatever, whatever the given in, uh, instrument is. So uh, that's the approach we took. And I think it has proven itself. It's certainly allowed um, a two way, true two way market to emerge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, though, you know, the, the, equip, the future gives you the ability to both take a view downward as well as upward yep. and express it financially. And, and, the, and, and the presence of a regulated two way market has allowed institutional interest mm -hmm. to come into um, Bitcoin and now Ether in, in a very fundamental way. You know, institutions. Uh, are wary of unregulated marketplaces, but one that's transparent and properly overseen is one where many institutions can play. And when you have both uh, a marketplace that balances retail with institutional, uh, with, 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 um, uh, a, in a two-way up or down marketplace, that's a healthy environment to establish value. Sure. Um, and I know with human nature, change is always difficult. And with the technology that we have before us that's moving at a rapid pace and Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain taking us to a more decentralized world, do you feel that's why there was such hard pushback? Like, what is this? No, we don't want it. We don't have control over it. Was it that type of emotions or feelings you think that were being, uh, being pushed yeah, against I, you? There's a lot going on. So this new wave of technology is, is, is a really extraordinary challenge for regulation generally, and I think American and Western regulation particularly. Mm. Why do I say that? Most of our regulation in the United States grew out of the Great Depression in the 1930s, sure. whether it be the Securities Acts 33 and 34 or uh, the, uh, the uh, Commodity Exchange Act of 1936, and the regulatory bodies that, that came about, the SEC and the CFTC, um, are, are, are regulatory structures on, compared to most global models are some of the most oldest there are. And, and the structures were built for a very different analog, person-to-person, paper-based world. They also follow a fairly traditional approach of regulation, which is um, regulators, whether it be financial regulators or healthcare or 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 um, uh, motor vehicles, virtually anything, any type of regulation, looks at an ecosystem to be regulated and says, okay, uh, where are the intermediaries? Where are the the central um, uh, uh, hub 
of, of the spokes. And then what regulators then do is, is identify them, um, uh, um, uh, license them, uh, make them subject to registration requirements, uh, uh, informational and data provision requirements, and basically deputize them to serve in roles as centralizers, uh, intermediaries, licensed intermediaries in the marketplace. At the CFTC, we license exchanges, we license exchange members, we license the, the, uh, the clearinghouses, the main intermediaries in the marketplace. And the same is true on and on again in regulation. So along comes a technology at which at its core decentralizes those centralization points. At its core, atomizes an environment that has historically been centralized. And that's tremendously challenging for these regulatory constructs that have been around for so long. Secondly, when it comes to crypto, um, you kind of have a couple of, uh, of reactions to it. I think that um, uh, island economies, the finance ministries of island economies, whether, it, whether they be um, uh, Singapore or the Bahamas or whether they be even Switzerland, who have long served as protectors of the assets of the residents of the onshore economies, always saw crypto as just another asset to be overseen. And so they've had a, a fairly good comfort level with the asset class. But continental economies with, with, with reserve currencies to protect, their central bankers have been really wary of, of Bitcoin and other crypto because of the challenge it presents to their sovereign reserve currencies that, they, that their role is to preserve. And then there are market regulators like us at the CFTC that very much saw this as um, a, a, another tradable asset that just needed to have a regulated, transparent infrastructure built around it. And so we were able to get comfortable with it faster. But broadly speaking, this new wave of the internet, the, 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 the decentralization nature of it, the peer-to-peer -peer nature of it, the, the uh, disintermediation characteristic of it, is going to be very, very, is very challenging and will remain, I think, challenging to sort of the antiquated, uh, largely analog based structure we have in the United States. And I think that is potentially uh, of strategic um, uh, risk to the United States because our economic competitors around the world right. that don't have these legacy uh, legal, uh, regulatory frameworks, that don't have some of the leg legacy systems that we have, mm -hmm. uh, are, are embracing this new technology uh, wholeheartedly and building a new framework mm -hmm. around it. And I think that it's it, that that is going to present a, a tremendous challenge to us. And I, I'm, I'm very much afraid that the combination of legacy legal and regulatory frameworks, legacy systems, whether they be uh, payment systems, whether they be settlement systems for securities, and then the, the, the media political mm. uh, uh, in, uh, infrastructure that, that supports the existing system and, 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 and is wary of challenges to it, I think all of them are going to perhaps hold us back, and I hope not hold us back, from modernizing our system if, in order to compete on a global basis going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the technology is moving at such a rapid pace, and there's obviously job opportunities and and to further boost the economy and tax revenue and all of that. Um, so, what do you think it would take to have, let's say, the CFTC, the SEC, fin, FinCEN, and everybody to be on the same page to move forward? Is it more lobbying and education, kind of what you're doing with the digital dollar project and so forth? Yeah. yeah. So first of all, let's, 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 you know, we have political culture to take account of. Our founders distrusted central authority, mm -hmm. right or wrong, they distrusted it. So their, their answer to that was to, was to defuse power amongst multiple political clusters. We've got a federalist system. So you've got a Washington power base, but you've got 50 states. Uh, but it also goes to the regulatory state. We don't have one market regulator in the United States. We have two, the SEC and the CFTC. The SEC for capital uh, formation markets, the CFTC for risk transfer markets. We don't have one banking regulator in Washington. We have three. 
the OCC, the FDIC, and, and the Fed. Um, and, and, yet, and then we have 50 state banking regulators. Right. Now, we may say, oh, that's a terrible thing. And, and in some ways, um, uh, it, it co- it, it's a subject of both redundancy um, and, uh, and, and, and complexity. On the other hand, it prevents the concentration of power. So uh, mm. many people have remarked positively on the CFTC's uh, openness to innovation over the, the past half decade, as compared to say the CFT, uh, the SEC's uh, uh, less um, 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 open openness to innovation. Now, for those people who have long said, well, let's combine the two agencies, let me ask, if the two agencies had been combined, which side would have won out over the last five years? Would it been openness to innovation or would it have been more closed-mindedness to innovation? Uh, you know, I, I think that one of the reasons the CFTC was was able to be more open minded is because it had its own leadership that was open to this, as opposed to being subsumed in its larger uh, brethren, the SEC. Uh, and so, um, I, I, you know, I have I'm of mixed views. I think there's benefits in our in our sort of more diffuse power structure, it allows a nimble agency like the CFTC to take steps that perhaps a more uh, a burdened agency like the SEC was not able to do. And having said that, the CFTC moved faster not only than our US regulators, but European ones as well. I mean, you know, it's, if there is only one regulated uh, crypto futures market today, and that's at the CFTC. So, so while we may bemoan the fact that the United States is perhaps not as quick as some, uh, reg- uh, some, some jurisdictions in Asia, certainly in the Western basis, we've shown that we can be quite, quite nimble. So, um, uh, I, so the answer, I don't think, mm-hmm. is consolidating regulators down. I think that's, that's an easy uh, talking point. But I don't think it necessarily solves the problem. I think it actually could slow us back. I think the bigger problem is uh, the the, the approach of regulation across the board in the United States, which, as I say, goes back to the 1930s, Mm. is that we regulate entities. It's that notion that I said of looking at an ecosystem and identifying the intermediaries and then regulating them. We regulate entities, and what happens when you regulate entities is they build their their incumbency, they build their supporters, they build they build their lobbyists, and they protect their position as incumbents. What we should think about doing is regulating activity, as opposed to regulating uh, entities, as opposed to regulating actors. We should regulate action. Mm. That would give a different mindset. If, if we think about consumer protection as an action that needs to be supported, we can focus on that rather than creating a whole, a whole um, uh, uh, power protection uh, infrastructure of, of regulated entities and their supporters in government, in the media, elsewhere. Uh, if, if, we, if we identify that, that, that uh, efficient capital markets are important, if we identify that financial inclusion uh, are important imperatives, if we, if we recognize that reducing fr- friction and costs and payments uh, are, are objectives, and I'm suggesting all these things because I personally think they are, Right. then what we should do is think about a regulatory regime that enhances those activities, but is not so much based upon, uh, uh, you know, delegate, uh, uh, registering, licensing, delegating entities, and then having them become lo- legacy entities that basically capture uh, the regulators themselves um, and, and it creates this, 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 um, um, uh, um, uh, resistance to innovation because they've now got their job and their and what they do and the regulators are happy with it and it's resistant to change. We need to sure. we need to bust through that resistance to change. And I think the answer is not consolidating regulators. I think it's more taking more of an into acti- activity base rather than an actor based approach to regulation. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. I, I never thought of it that way. You know, I thought the consolidation would make sense, but checks and balances, right? You, you got to have those different, uh, those bodies to keep a balance. So 
Um, on that note, Gary Gensler, I think today is his confirmation. What are your thoughts on him? It, you know, I've seen him teaching at MIT. Seems very smart and, and he understands, S, uh, uh, excuse me, Bitcoin, crypto. What are your thoughts on him? And maybe we see some forward movement for regulations from the SEC. I get, look, Gary is probably one of the the, the brightest, uh, smartest, uh, most penetrating uh, regulators uh, on the Washington scene of the last decade or so. He's also very well versed in markets. Um, I, I think having served at the CFTC is actually going to pre pre prepare him very well for the SEC because it's two sides of the financial market coin. As I said, the CFTC regulates markets for risk transfer, uh, risk management, and, and, and risk uh, uh, price setting. Um, and the SEC regulates markets for capital allocation, capital formation. Um, uh, so I think with Gary's background at the CFTC, it brings an enormous amount of broad overview to the role uh, at the SEC. Gary's also somebody who knows how to get things done. I watched him uh, it, um, be very involved in the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act and then implement an enormous amount of it at the CFTC. Now, I've had my uh, public disagreements with Gary over some of that implementation. And uh, the, the, the thing I enjoy about my relationship with Gary is I tell him exactly what I think and he tells me exactly what he thinks. And I think uh, uh, that's a healthy relationship. Um, uh, I actually think he can bring a lot of value to the SEC in terms of uh, its approach to FinTech and innovation. Uh, at heart, uh, Gary is a markets guy. Gary Gensler uh, believes in markets, uh, believes in their role and, and, is, and, 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 and is truly uh, a, 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 a market person, a market oriented person. I think he understands that the uh, U.S. is in a, in a fight uh, right now for who's going to set the standards for these new innovations. Uh, and I think he will um, um, acquit himself very well. I think he will champion the U.S.'s role at, global, at, at the global level mm -hmm. in standard setting for these new innovations. And I'm, I'm optimistic that he can help working with others like Hester Peirce at the, at the SEC and uh, some of the folks at the, at, at the CFTC uh, in maybe bringing forward a framework for the oversight of crypto, um, which would be a framework that people can understand and it wouldn't be driven by enforcement actions, it would actually be driven by proper policy development. So I'm quite optimistic, I, I, I have to commend President Biden for the selection of Gary Gensler, I think um, he's, he's a good choice. As I say, we've had our disagreements and I'm sure there'll be some things in the future that, um, that he might champion that I might not agree with, but I can't take away from the fact that he's a solid markets person with a very strong understanding of financial markets. And now after the last few years at MIT, very understanding of crypto and crypto markets as well. Sure. Um, and one of the things that the SEC, the Howey test, seems to be kind of a roadblock right now for a lot of digital assets in the market. Do you feel uh, to what you're describing, you know, more of the action versus the entity, a uh, Howey test 2.0 is needed, you know, a second version for digital assets crypto? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Howey test has been uh, um, uh, explored and, and, and teased out probably as far as it can go for this new innovation. But, it, you know, it was never designed for a, a, for a digital environment. And the fact that we've spent as much time uh, uh, applying it against these new innovations to decide whether something falls on the SEC side of the ledger, or the CFTC side of the ledger, uh, is... Um, uh, uh, it's disappointing, quite frankly, uh, as someone who really believes that the United States um, has historically and needs to continue to see a, to be a world standard center for new innovation. The fact that we're relying on a, on a legal precedent from 1946 to uh, determine the, the right course for regulating an entirely new uh, technology and an entirely new financial architecture 
is, is disappointing is, is almost uh, um, too light of a phrase. It, it's, it's almost ridiculous, quite frankly, uh, that that's what we're left at. And I think the time has truly come, and I've been calling for this for a long time, but I think the time has truly come for the market regulators working with Congress uh, to develop a new framework that's, that's properly designed for this new asset class and does you know, address important issues like consumer protection, financial inclusion, et cetera. But let's, let's write it new. Uh, let's get it right from the start rather than relying on, uh, on a precedent that's 70 years old. Absolutely. I'm in total agreement there with you. And um, I want to switch gears a bit and talk about the digital dollar project because we just recently heard uh, Chairman, uh, the Fed Chairman Powell talk about it. This might, this might be the year. Um, tell us about the digital dollar project and what your role is there. Sure. So um, we launched a digital dollar project in January of 2020 at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and we co coined the frame digital dollar to refer to uh, a U.S. central bank digital currency. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as you know, uh, over 70 percent of the world's major central banks, maybe as high as 80 percent, are exploring central bank digital currency now. Uh, and, and what I would say is most of them are relatively late to the game of something that started a decade ago with Bitcoin and has evolved. In fact, the, 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 um, I want to make a central observation because it, it may, when I say it, it may seem so apparent, but I don't think it has been so apparent. Money is not exclusively a government construct. Hmm. Money is as much of a social construct as it is a government construct. Now, I think to most people in society, that's self-evident, but I don't think to central bankers, it has been. I think central bankers tend to think of money as their exclusive uh, domain. But if you look at history, money has been as much a social construct as it's been a government construct. Sure. And society did not wait for a permission slip from central banks to begin experimenting with uh, money for the past decade. In fact, those experimentations have gone far and wide. And in fact, it's a reaction to the success of those experiments, whether through payment systems or development of, of decentralized instruments like Bitcoin, that I think the world's central bankers have stepped back and say, wow, this is getting away from us. We need to step in. And I, and I would identify perhaps six buckets of areas where central banks have looked at this innovation and have suddenly said, we need to jump in here. And I would start with um, data capture. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in many ways, uh, the moves of the Chinese central bank um, are a reaction to the success of AntPay and WeChat Pay in building enormous payment systems and, and the notion that they would capture all that, tra that, that transaction data, I think, moved the Chinese government. But you don't even need to look to Beijing. That's exactly what happened in Washington when Libra announced its initiative. And I think a lot of people in Washington said, what, Facebook is going to have all of this financial transaction data? So I think the first imperative for central banks to react to society's experimentation with money was because of data capture. Mm. Uh, another reason has been for wholesale market uh, efficiency. If you look at what Singapore has done, Singapore, an island economy, almost you know, entirely built upon financial services, have seen cent a central bank digital currency as an opportunity to explore much more efficient, frictionless wholesale payment systems. And then a third reason has been financial inclusion. Um, I think island economies like the Bahamas, for example, which are exploring something they call the sand dollar, mm. are very concerned about uh, citizens of their country based upon outwardly uh, out, outward islands that don't necessarily have easy access to bank facilities, but are well equipped uh, with mobile devices. It was an opportunity for them, and it is an opportunity for them, to generate greater financial inclusion. And then what I would call... Um, uh, uh, monetary policy, surgical precision. Uh, we certainly saw in the financial crisis here in the United States when 
um, our government and central banks sought to put money in the hands of people that were being immediately left off, that they saw firsthand the inefficiency of using antiquated paper check systems to try to get to money to people. And so the ability to bring a surgical precision uh, to, um, uh, to monetary policy became another imperative. And then I would add geopolitical influence. China, having started down the road, I think, for uh, uh, desire to make sure they, they captured all the data of transactions, realizes that combined with their Belt and Road Initiative, that, that the ability to have a central bank digital currency is a very, very powerful tool. And I think we're all going to see next winter when we get to the Beijing Olympics, how China is using this tool to put it in the hands, not just of their own citizens, but visitors from around the world for them to take back to their countries hmm. and utilize there. And then I'll end with what I think of all of these issues, the, all of these reasons to experiment with the central bank digital currency, I'll end with the one that I think is the most important sure. and particularly the most important for the West and especially the most important for the United States. And that is values. At the end of the day, um, uh, money carries values with it. I would posit for your listeners that certain values built in the American dollar have been part of the reason for the dollar's ascendancy as the world's primary reserve currency. Sure. Values like uh, free markets, values like um, uh, entrepreneurship and aspirational uh, 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 social development and personal development. Values like the right balance of privacy against the state's interest in law, legitimate interest in law enforcement. Uh, values like the rule of law in, 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 in judging commercial disputes. Those values are critically important. And I think that's the most important reason why the United States needs to accelerate experimentation with the digital dollar to make sure those values and others that we hold dear as, as, a, as a democratic society are ingrained into the digital future of money. And why is that important? It's because if we don't, then our economic competitors and their digital currency reflecting their values will become the global norm. And what could some of those values be? Well, state surveillance. Yeah. There's a reason why the protesters in Hong Kong were trying to use cash for transactions in the subway and not digital payments because of government surveillance of their, acti of their political activities. Uh, it, it's a Western value that the government only has limited rights. And sac in fact, in the United States, it's ingrained in our Fourth Amendment to invade privacy. And we accept there's a right balance for law enforcement, but outside of uh, uh, illicit activities, legitimate activities, whether they be expressions of political views or religious views, are private to the individual. So the reason I think of all the important reasons that the United States needs to be a leader in setting the standards for central bank digital currency is to make sure that the values that got us here, values of appropriate privacy rights, the rule of law, free markets, uh, uh, aspirations of, of, of wealth creation, those values are ingrained in the future of a digital money. And I hope that future will be the dollar remains one of the world's principal reserve currencies on, for all the reasons I mentioned, and most importantly, because of the values ingrained in it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, once again, I, I did not think of it that way and the values that are carried over. And of course, the competition from a macro economic level. Now, there are some who, I certainly see the benefits of this, and there are some who would say, but Chris, am I going to lose some of my privacy my, um, when you align this to maybe the constitution, right? That the government can track everything, even though there's a lot of benefits to this. What would you say to that? So when you have an analog system, the limitations in it are built, are, 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 are are a result of the technology itself. So with paper dollars, you have a right, you have privacy in it, but part of the reason you have a privacy in it is because it's just very hard for anybody to track all of those, the movement of those dollars. So we kind of have a rough understanding that transactions under $10,000 have absolute, relative absolute privacy. Transactions over that, there's reporting obligations to FinCEN and others by financial institutions. 
but those those levels are somewhat ingrained in the nature, uh, the architecture of the instrument itself. When you go from an analog system to a digital system in any walk of life, you have now all kinds of uh, uh, of policy choices that can be programmed in. Sure. Right from the beginning, and so one of the reasons we need to experiment now with the digital dollar is because we need to think about programming and privacy as a design feature right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Not surveillance as a design feature right from the beginning, but privacy as a design feature. And we need to have a national debate. Where, what are the limits on that privacy? Where does it begin? Where does it end? When does the state have a right to, to view that information? And if commercial actors ever have a right to view that information, where and how and who 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 gets paid for that uh, information? Uh, are, are the commercial actors get to mine us for free, or do we get a say of that and decide how we might want to be paid for that information? So, with a digital instrument, we can, as a design feature, build in the zone of privacy is, that is the society we believe in. And I think if we get that right, that could be the killer app of of the future of money. The United States could design a central bank digital currency with the right balance of privacy that makes it the most attractive uh, uh, digital currency to use in the world, as opposed to other currencies where there's going to be uh, either government surveillance or or, or commercial surveillance uh, by online vendors and otherwise. So it's so important to build that in right from the start, start as a design feature. But if we don't build in privacy into a digital dollar, it's no better than any other uh, state currency, and and that would be a, a, the a most enormous disappointment I could possibly think of if we don't, in a U.S. dollar, provide a level of privacy that we 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 embrace as a society. It's built into our constitution. Americans and people around the world expect it, and it should be built in as a design choice. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely glad to hear that. Um, you know, that's your stance, and that is the guardrails, not just for the end user, but also the government. That what's the line they cannot cross to make sure there's some level of privacy there. Um, exactly. Now, uh, have you? I'm assuming you, you're working with the Federal Reserve Chairman Powell at this point, or conversations are having, dialogues happening. Absolute, great, very good conversations, not only at the board level but at the Fed presidency level. Uh, uh, throughout the government, I, I was just on the phone just this week with members of the Senate Banking Committee uh, discussing the digital dollar project um, and our work. As you know, I uh, may know, I testified last summer three times, um, uh, it, uh, two times before a, a, Senate, a Senate Banking, the full committee and a subcommittee, and then also a House Task Force on, on digital currency and fintech on this subject. So there's a lot of dialogue going on. Uh, what what we have right now is a very active uh, and a very um, a forward thinking project going on right now between uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and MIT, looking at some of the core technology issues. And I think they're they're doing very fine work. That's a relatively um, a closed end silo. Uh, and uh, it's less focused on the policy side than it is on the technology side. What's, what we don't have right now is a more open-ended forum for the private sector actors to, to interact with the official sector and look at some of these policy dimensions, financial inclusion, uh, uh, pilot programs for remittance payments or for government benefits. And that's something that we champion at the Digital Dollar Project. And, and uh, I'm hoping in the next few weeks that the Digital Dollar Project will be able to speak publicly about some ideas we have in this area for experimentation with real live pilot programs to look at some of these policy challenges and policy opportunities mm -hmm. for a US central bank digital currency that we call a digital dollar. Got it. So walk us through, you know, let's say the digital dollar is fully built and live. You've gone through all the testing, all the guardrails, everything's in place, everything aligns with the constitution, so on and so forth. Would I then get a, uh, as having a smartphone, a wallet from the Federal Reserve, and then if there's stimulus payments or whatever it may be, I would get that transferred to my wallet on my phone? Is that how it would work? So, so Tony, there's, there's, uh, 
many models for what this could look like. Um, and, and thoughtful people have posited a lot of different things. My good friend, Brian Brooks, the former controller of the currency, views non-sovereign stable coins as providing a part of the solution. Uh, but we at the Digital Dollar Project proposed something last summer that we call a champion model. And what we mean by that is we don't think it's the be all and end all, but we put it out there for discussion and review because we thought it was sort of the the the, the mainstream uh, uh, mainstream approach, the, the approach that perhaps had the most promise. And our approach is that first of all, that a U.S. central bank digital currency would be a tokenized instrument, not an accounts based instrument. So tokenized meaning that the verification in a transaction is of the instrument itself, not of uh, the identity of the parties and the accounts that they may be using. So in, in, in easy to understand logic, the difference between a token-based system and an accounts-based system would be at the point of purchase in a retail transaction. Right now, when you, when you um, uh, tap your, uh, uh, you know, Apple Pay uh, wallet on your mobile device at a cash register, that really doesn't move money today. What that does is send a series of messages to uh, uh, people that oversee accounts to verify identity, verify account sufficiency, verify, uh, enact a transaction, verify receipt of funds. Um, it, that's an account-based approach. A token-based approach is when you tap your mobile device against the kiosk, uh, uh, that actually moves money there and then. Hmm. The two contact points verify that it is actually a digital piece of money and the money is moved. No need to verify identification, no need to verify account sufficiency, no need to verify to move money from, from a, an account to an account, and no need to verify it. So it's a, a more efficient approach, and that's what we put forward in our champion model. The second point is that we recommend it be, it be initially, uh, the, the ledger in which it be originally set would be established by the Federal Reserve, and then distributed the way cash is actually distributed today by the Federal Reserve, to the regional banks, to commercial banks, and to ATM machines. And in a similar way, this would be distributed by the Federal Reserve into the banking system and then downloadable by you on your Citibank uh, wallet app or other, other maybe perhaps a uh, non-bank financial service firm wallet applications and distribute in that way. We also do not propose that a digital dollar would pay interest because we very much want to maintain, you know, banks play many roles in the in important roles in the economy, mm -hmm. one of which um, is a, a multiplier effect. They take short term deposits and they use it to make long term loans. Without that, it'd be very difficult for us to buy a car and buy our first house uh, to, to start a business. And, and so for that function to remain, uh, people hopefully will take their, their digital currencies and put it on deposit with the banking institution in order to enjoy interest and safekeeping. And that will uh, preserve the, the lending function of banks. Now, there's another role that banks play in the world, and that's correspondent banking. Mm -hmm. That is moving money around the globe by doing that uh, account verification, that, that identity verification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, that's a challenge. That, in fact, that's being challenged by this new technology. And even if there's not a central bank digital currency, that's a that's a function that that's that's in a sense a um, a relic of an old accounts based system that is being quickly transformed. In a lot of ways, you know, when I was growing up, you take a photograph on a camera, you'd need to have that film developed by Kodak. And then you'd get it back if you wanted to send it to somebody around the world. You'd put it in an envelope, put postage on it, send it. You had all these intermediaries. You had the developer. You had the post office, et cetera, et cetera. Well, today, that's not how we take photographs and send them. We, we, we take them and we send them to the recipient immediately without a developer, without a post office, et cetera, et cetera. I, I hate to tell the correspondent banking uh, institutions, but that's what's happening to money. And whether it's in the form of a CBDC or whether it's in the stable coin or, or another country's central bank digital currency, 
the correspondent banking system is going to be challenged by this technology. Mm -hmm. But the core value of banks as lending institutions, I don't think is challenged by this technology. And I think if it's done right, is enhanced by this technology. And that's what we propose in, in our, in, in our challenge, in our, what we call our champion model. Got it. So the big question a lot of folks want to know is which blockchain will the digital dollar be running on? Because is it going to be a private, uh, maybe a proprietary from the Federal Reserve or a public blockchain, an Ethereum, an XRP ledger? I don't know, whatever it may be. Right. So, so, so um, the ability to write to the blockchain when, it, when you're talking about a central bank digital currency that enjoys the full faith and credit of the United States, I, I think it would be very much a challenge to have that a fully open blockchain uh, in, in the nature of, of Bitcoin. I think it would be a permissioned blockchain, but with permission extended to financial institutions that meet a licensure requirement to conduct transactions and to record those transactions to this permissioned blockchain. On the other hand, there are elements of transparency to this blockchain that could be provided wide so that you can know that a payment you made was received by a recipient uh, by having access to that element, that those nodes of the blockchain in order to do individual verification. So I think this is an important part. I think that uh, the, the Bank of the Boston MIT project is looking at some aspects of this. Uh, you know, one thing I can tell you is, and that is a U.S. central bank digital currency will be the most hacked instrument ever created sure. in a digital world. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the, the national security concerns, the economic security concerns, the privacy concerns that need to be taken into account as we think about what the nature of that blockchain would look like, who would have access to it, for what purposes, to what extent. Got it. Um, so I guess we'll have to wait to hear and what's being built on that front. <laughs> um, awesome. So I'm very excited about, you know, the digital dollar and, you know, as far as the timeline, I know, obviously, we talked about regulations and many other things and getting the analog to digital and government. Um, when do you think we might see a rollout? If, if you know, if you can hint towards a, a timeline? Well, I'll say this, I, I think the US official sector leadership uh, in the federal government um, have gone from a view of, uh, say, 18 months ago, that they were not even sure the United States needed to devote many resources to ex examine this, to perhaps a position of nine months ago that the U.S. very much needs to explore this, to a position of perhaps six months ago that we probably need to get there in this decade to, I think, increasingly a realization that the United States needs to accelerate this uh, to developing perhaps a working model for this uh, within three to, three to five years. Um, the advances that China is making in this regard, and it's not just China, the recognition from the last crisis that our existing uh, architecture of money uh, is, is inefficient, uh, in getting money in the hands in crisis times to the most needy. It's costly when you look at 7 to 17% for global remittances. Mm -hmm. uh, it's filled with friction. Um, uh, it, 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 it is, it's, it's, it's antiquated. Uh, and that just simply money is moving on in the same, you know, the first wave of the internet was the internet of information. And we don't even think about Encyclopedia Britannica more and the others that owned all information because that's been decentralized and it's at our fingertips. Why would we think that the same is not going to happen to money? It's just a, a short-sighted view. The same dynamics are changing the nature of money. And as I said before, society has been doing this experiment now for 10 years and the official sector is just waking up to that. And it, it, it's right. It's right to be cautious. I, uh, Chairman Powell is absolutely right that it's far more important to get this right than to get this fast. But the stakes are going up, um, and if the United States is going to exert leadership, you know, one of the things that our our overseas economic competitors are very good at is um, uh, um, getting involved in the standard settings of new technologies. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just the innovations themselves, it's the standards. 
it's the protocols. It, it's, the, it's the global agreements on the key elements of that that are so important. And in order for the United States to, to be at the, not just at the table when those standards are setting, but at the center of the table, right. we need to up our ex, 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 exploration of this dramatically. And I think it, it's happening. And, I, and I'd like to believe that the Digital Dollar Project has contributed to that debate over the course of the past year. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm hoping uh, the urgency sets in with some of the different folks and we get that moving fast. Because yeah, we've seen some screenshots and videos of uh, China's CBDC in the wild, so to speak. Um, so final question here on, on CBDCs. We're going to have every country and central bank in the world having CBDCs. We're going to have stable coins. Then there's Bitcoin and digital assets. How do you see all of this working together? Are stable coins going to be a Com competition for CBDCs and vice versa, and I, I may be a bit too early to talk about it. But well, so so first of all, I I, I personally believe that the, the more the better. The 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 experiment the, the in fact the official sector has got the benefit of all this work that's been done, all this experimentation to learn from as it as it thinks about central bank digital currency. Um, but but I I think this is for the better. I think that the more uh, exper experimentation that happens as the better. And I was always resistant to any urges to suppress Bitcoin or suppress der derivatives uh, on, on cryptocurrencies during my time at the agency. I, that's not the way we roll in the United States. Um, the, the internet didn't come about through central planning. The internet came about through just sort of a glorious um, uh, hodgepodge and, and unplanned mixture of private sector and official sector interaction. Uh, whether it was the Department of Defense and DARPA with the initial architecture and then the private sector developing that and building internet commerce on the back of it. And I think I'd like to see the same glorious mixture of, uh, of start and stop and, and, and success and failure take place as we experiment with digital money. And I think that's, that's, to, that's to our strength. And I think uh, ultimately, hopefully, that will allow us to set some of those key standards as we learn from our experience uh, on a global stage. So I don't call for suppression. I think that um, they, all these different instruments will play themselves out. I think Bitcoin has a unique value proposition uh, as does Ethereum. And I don't necessarily see a central bank digital currency uh, challenging that. Um, and I don't really want to identify specific um, uh, uh, cryptos, but you know they all have unique approach. And I think every one of them uh, it should be tested in, in the light of day and in, in, the, in, the, in the give and take of real markets um, to find out where, you know, how those, what, what the lasting uh, value proposition is of each one of them. Absolutely. Um, so I want to circle back to Bitcoin and uh, I know we have just a few minutes here. Uh, you had mentioned that your kids had uh, w bought Bitcoin, they participated in the market. Are they still holding? Are they still buying? <laughs> So I, 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 I really have to give most credit uh, to my niece uh, and my, my, my uh, godchild uh, who uh, bought Bitcoin um, at various amounts between $200 and $400. Wow. And uh, has, is, is a holder and who is a, is a real um, uh, uh, believer in the long-term uh, value proposition and uh, on a family ski trip in, in uh, December 2017, uh, we got to spend some time together and really opened my eyes to a lot of things, along with my own children who, who were all together. And, um, uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah, my kids and my, my niece and uh, nieces uh, are, are holders. And, um, uh, you know, and I think there's a generational thing here as well. And I think one of the challenges for regulators is some of them don't quite see that in the way that uh, generations uh, to come just get it Im implicitly, and that's another reason why there's no turning back on this on this on this brave new world. Uh, what we've got to do is what we've always done in the United States: is take control of it, take leadership of it, uh, and innovate around it. Absolutely. So I have to ask: since being outside now, you're outside of your regulatory capacity. Are you holding any Bitcoin or any other cryptos? 
Yeah. So um, I, I, uh, I have an investment in a fund that is an actively managed fund of, of crypto and blockchain investments. And, um, uh, and I think that's a good vehicle for, for my investment portfolio to um, put money where my mouth is in terms of believing in this, this wave of innovation, but without picking and choose amongst the different instruments. I'll leave that to some, uh, uh, some very smart people that are really, that's their daily focus. So uh, yes, I, I'm, 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 I'm all in and in, in, uh, in, in uh, I'm long, but I'm long in a sort of uh, a balanced portfolio. Sure, so speaking of instruments and vehicles, when do you think we might see a Bitcoin ETF? Everybody's begging for it here in the United States. Well, it looks, you know, Toronto's beat us to it. Um, and it's launched uh, just in the last two weeks. And I think some of the early results have been quite positive. So my hat's off to the Toronto Exchange uh, for doing that. I'm disappointed it was, uh, you know, one of our economic competitors and not a U.S. exchange. Uh, but that's what happens if you, if you, if you, if you snooze, you lose. Um, and uh, one of our competitors has got to jump on us on this, and we'll wait and see how it develops. But the, I think the early indications have been quite positive. Sure. Um, and look, we've seen a variety of companies. I mean, just Elon, Tesla, MicroStrategy, Square, putting Bitcoin in a balance sheet. I, I interviewed the mayor of Miami. He's talking about allocating some of the city's treasury reserves in Bitcoin. What do you think? I mean, what do you think about that? It, it seems like so groundbreaking. And if we have so many companies and cities doing this the price of Bitcoin going exponential. Yeah. So I, you know, I never want to express a view as to where uh, a commodity price could go. Um, uh, what I would say is that the presence of a two way regulated marketplace at the CFTC allows for institutions to engage, you know, in this market and, and the, the broader and the more diverse the participants in a marketplace is the deeper the liquidity, the, 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 the healthier the, the, the environment is for trading and price discovery. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, done in a prudent way, a thoughtful way with a balanced portfolio, I think it makes a lot of sense. And you're seeing major institutions across the board uh, engage in this area. Got it. Well, final question here. Um, rapid fire. What's your favorite food? Watermelon. Uh, what's your favorite, or I should say, who's your favorite musician or band? Uh, I, I love music. So, oh uh, gosh, uh, I've been listening to a lot of uh, Diana Krall lately. Uh, she's just a great uh, uh, songstress, but just a, a great jazz pianist. Uh, and some of her work with John Pizzarelli is just fabulous. So, um, but I was, I was, uh, my son, who's a great musician, is a drummer. I was pointing out to him uh, some of the work uh, of uh, uh, Chet Baker and others. And, and let me put in a plug. My favorite band <laughs> is Dobingo. Uh, and that's the band of my son, Henry. He's a drummer in the band. They just launched the first album on Spotify. It's called Sharp and Creamy. And the band is called Dobingo. Check it out. Awesome. Amazing. Uh, favorite movie? It's got to be trading places okay. uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but because of its depiction of the commodity markets, which I had the pleasure to oversee as a regulator. Awesome. And favorite book? Anything by Neil Ferguson, any of his works on uh, mon uh, money and the banking system, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my favorite author, though, for fiction is, is uh, Ernest Hemingway. Excellent. And when you're not working at, you know, doing the digital dollar stuff and at the law firm, what are you doing for fun as far as a hobby? Oh, so, so I've got a great band myself, uh, Major Andre and the Turncoats. Um, we, we performed one of the last sort of um, public performances two weeks before the lockdown from COVID at the 76 house in, um, in, in uh, Tapan, New York. And we're, hope, we're working on a date right now for hopefully August to reopen and, and get folks back out listening to some great music. I got to come see you. I mean. Yeah, done. Done. Okay. I'll tweet about it. I'll send out uh, a tweet <laughs> and check it out. I, I love live music. I miss concerts uh, so much. And uh, yeah, I will definitely come see you uh, and, and see your band. Chris, such a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I feel so educated, so much information today, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Hey, Tony, it really was my pleasure. Let's do it again soon. Absolutely.